The question, is Yellowstone gonna blow? Yellowstone, if it erupts in a maximum eruption, it could literally tear the guts out of the United States of America. That's crazy. When Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX, warns about something, it's a big deal. Recently, there's been an alert from the Yellowstone system that has Musk worried. The Yellowstone area, known for its large dome-shaped uplift, is getting bigger, surprising many. But why is this important? And what exactly has Musk so concerned? Let's find out as we explore the news about the growing dome-shaped uplift in Yellowstone. What exactly is Yellowstone? The Yellowstone National Park is a vast piece of land spanning over 2.2 million acres, a beautiful blend of nature's beauty and geological complexities. Lurking deep underneath the Yellowstone is potential, one that has caught the eye of scientists. The Yellowstone is no ordinary volcano you see, it is a supervolcano or a cura volcano. Now we all know the story of Pompeii, the city in ancient Rome that was covered completely by a volcanic eruption. Yes, only imagine this time, a bigger volcanic eruption. Yes, this super volcano has the potential to wipe out countries and even continents, making the eruption of Pompeii pale in comparison. This colossal force of nature has a history of erupting every six to 800,000 years. This means that one of the world's most captivating volcanic systems has shaped this iconic park. And no, this danger is not just left alone, as geological forces are working beneath the surface, diligently monitoring this supervolcano. The United States Geological Survey especially continues to monitor this colossal force of nature around the clock. This global menace has remained dormant for over 64,000 years, leaving in its wake resurgent domes shaped by cataclysmic, or as the case may be, natural geological events. Joe Rogan has continued to issue stark warnings about the dangers of the Yellowstone. One heavy question weighs on the mind of everyone right now, and it is whether this volcanic behemoth is waking up. Are we threading on the thread of cataclysmic destruction, such as never seen before? Are we closing our eyes to the destruction of unimaginable magnitude? Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla and SpaceX, and the man who is campaigning for Mars to get nuked, has offered his unfiltered thoughts on the issue. He raises questions about the recent geological changes and whether or not these issues are all connected to a potential Yellowstone eruption. The caldera formed during the last three super eruptions over the past 2.1 million years. The Huckleberry eruption of 2.1 million years ago, which created the Island Park caldera and the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. The Mesa Falls eruption of 1.3 million years ago, which created the Henry's Fork Caldera and the Mesa Falls Tuff. And the Lave Creek eruption approximately 640,000 years ago, which created the Yellowstone Caldera and the Lava Creek Tuff. The eruption of 640,000 years ago ejected a groundbreaking 1,000 cubic kilometers of material blanketing North America in ash and altering global climate patterns. But what happens after such a massive super eruption? Does the world simply bat an eyelid and move on? How did the Earth shake off such an event? And are we free from such events ever occurring again? The Yellowstone story is not quite finished yet. The story continues with the formation of resurgent domes. These domes are quite a significant geological phenomenon. After the last super eruption, the magma chamber beneath the caldera began to refill, and this led to the creation of such beautiful yet dangerous geological features in Yellowstone Park. There are these massive domes that are not just small bumps on the land. Each of them is quite big, with each of them over 10 kilometers wide and rising hundreds of meters above the Cura floor. These domes are not just there for show, but also play a crucial role in understanding what's happening with the park's geothermal activity, and it also holds clues as to what might happen in the future. Taking a closer look at these domes, one can see that the Cura floor is going through some serious changes. What this indicates is that the Yellowstone volcanic system is very much awake and not taking a nap as we all assume it to be. It is ready to explode at any time. As calm and serene as it looks on the surface, underneath it is a monster that can potentially shake everything. And this is just the beginning. As much as we have found out about Yellowstone, there is still a lot more to discover. Elon Musk has been talking about the Yellowstone supervolcano 
for quite some time now. And no, Elon is not saying these things to amaze us or make us happy. He's giving us a heads up, a warning about the potential dangers of this sleeping giant under one of America's most famous spots. Elon is the champion of free speech, which is one of the reasons he acquired Twitter, now X. So you just know that whatever it is he is saying about this sleeping giant will be unfiltered. And on one of his talk shows, he drops a bombshell. He thinks that the Yellowstone supervolcano has started its eruption. And the thought of something so huge and powerful being on the move is so terrifying. This has the potential to change the scope of the world as we know it. Musk does not stop there. He breaks down the threat of supervolcanoes, including Yellowstone, whilst keeping it simple. He makes us realize the enormity of the situation. It is like a wake-up call to acknowledge the power beneath our feet and the chance of something happening whose effect would be felt globally and just in the United States. He does not beat around the bush, but directly warns us about the Yellowstone supervolcano erupting. His words make you think and reflect on nature and respect nature's force. Nature has a habit of being quiet most of the time, but when it wants to unleash, it unleashes devastation on a massive scale. His wake-up call pushes the talk about the Yellowstone volcano and its danger to the spotlight, highlighting the need for people to know what is going on and be ready for something serious. These warnings from Musk and the supervolcano erupting align with recent scientific discoveries. Digging deeper into the mysteries of the Yellowstone caldera makes his concerns even more urgent. Scientists recently made a shocking discovery about Yellowstone. A raised dome within the volcano challenges everything we currently know about dormant volcanoes and raises more questions about what lies beneath the surface. Dr. Robert Christensen and the University of Utah's Robert Smith stumbled upon this revelation while studying changes in water levels at Yellowstone Lake. Smith was fascinated by a few changes in the Yellowstone caldera and noticed inconsistent water levels in different parts of Yellowstone Lake. This variation suggested that the entire lake's basin was tilting, similar to a seesaw. This tilting indicates a notable shift in the geological shift in the calm waters that we see. To help us understand this better, let me paint a clear picture. On a two-end swing, if more weight is placed on one, the other side gets lifted. This phenomenon at Yellowstone Lake hinted at a specific force pushing up from below, disrupting the ground and water above. Dr. Christensen described this disturbance as a spectacular dome-shaped uplift. This uplift could be caused by a host of things, including magma molten rocks beneath the Earth's surface, pushing it into the crust. Alternatively, it might result from the park's hydrothermal system involving hot water and steam, expanding and pushing the ground upward. Whichever case it is, the end case of both scenarios is an active and changing magnetic system below Yellowstone, reshaping the landscape. With modern technology, scientists can better monitor the Yellowstone. With the use of GPS and INSAR, they are now able to detect even the slightest movement. These tools are significant improvements from the tools available to man in the past and a sign that man is evolving in a good way. Previous methods employed include geodesy, which involved leveling to measure vertical formation. In the early days, geodesists used a meticulous technique called leveling measuring elevation differences with an instrument. By repeating these measurements across the park, scientists have been able to come up with a detailed map of ground movements. The first leveling occurred in 1923, and it left behind a lasting legacy with over 500 benchmarks still standing in Yellowstone National Park. The technological advancement of today allows scientists to continuously monitor and understand the dynamic changes occurring beneath Yellowstone's surface. However, despite all these modern measures, nothing is stopping the Yellowstone Cura once it decides to go off. Elon talked about Yellowstone's history, its surroundings, and its notable unpredictability. Following the 1975 6.1 magnitude earthquake in Yellowstone Park, a surprising discovery was revealed. The center of the Cura had risen by more than 28 inches since 1923, at an average of 1.4 centimeters per year. This uplift, far exceeding the earthquake's effects, indicates one thing. The ground was swelling, rising faster than most trees grow in years. Between 1923 and 1975, up to 77 scientists observed significant ground-level changes at Yellowstone, and the most dramatic changes occurred between the two key areas of M Lake and Sour Creek. 
Resurgent domes near well-known landmarks like Old Faithful and Large Rapids are like trampoline surfaces, sagging under weight and gradually returning to their original shape as the weight is lifted back. This is similar to how the ground at Yellowstone was rising from 1983 to 1985. Scientists continuously monitored the ongoing lift round the clock, but in 1985a, seismic shift took place. A swarm of earthquakes took place near the northwest edge of the caldera. Consequently, the gradually rising ground began to sink back down in a process known as subsidence. Scientists concluded that that fluids like magma, hot water, and steam building up pressure underneath the surface started to leak out, relieving the pressure and causing the ground to rise. But what bewilders scientists is that the behavior of the Cura's floors from 1995 onwards became even more complex. New parts of the floor rose while other parts sunk. A new zone of uplifts emerged with unprecedented rise rates in the region's recorded history. Amidst this geological turmoil, scientists noticed a trembling connection between the Earth's erratic movements and the swarm of earthquakes. The Cura fluctuating surface signified unseen forces at work. Another startling discovery occurred near Hidden Falls in Grand Teton National Park. A massive crack about 100 feet high and 300 feet long appeared in a rock overnight. This crack, now known as the Hidden Falls Fissure, is one of Musk's biggest concerns due to its proximity to the Yellowstone supervolcano. Its sudden appearance is a stark reminder of nature's unpredictability. Whilst the Teton area is not directly on top of Yellowstone, it is closely connected to the larger Yellowstone system. Discoveries like this crack send a chill down the spine and are very alarming, but in this case, it was not entirely unexpected in such an active landscape. However, it is its proximity to the massive Yellowstone that heightens concerns among the scientific community and the knowledgeable public. This is not a random crack. This is a reminder of the constant underground processes going on beneath us. It is a result of continuous movements in the Earth's crust. The Yellowstone is not the only supervolcano on the Earth. There are two others, and let us check them out, with the hopes that they are not as active as the Yellowstone caldera. Having three supervolcanoes go off is not something anyone would like to imagine, like the one that happened at Lake Toba. Lake Toba. Lake Toba is the site of a supervolcanic eruption estimated at VEI-8 that occurred 69,000 to 77,000 years ago, representing a climate-changing event. Recent advances in dating methods suggest a more accurate identification of 74,000 years ago as the date. It is the largest known explosive eruption on Earth in the last 25 million years. According to the Toba catastrophe theory, it had global consequences for human populations. It killed most humans living at that time and is believed to have created a population bottleneck in Central East Africa and India, which affects the genetic makeup of the human worldwide population to the present. More recent studies have cast doubt on this theory and found no evidence of substantial changes in the global population. It was also suggested that the eruption of the Toba caldera led to a volcanic winter with a worldwide decrease in temperature between 3 and 5 degrees Celsius, 5.4 and 9.0 degrees Fahrenheit, and up to 15 degrees Celsius, 27 degrees Fahrenheit. In higher latitudes, additional studies in Lake Malawi in East Africa show significant amounts of ash being deposited from the Toba caldera eruptions, even at that great distance, but little indication of a significant climatic effect in East Africa. The Toba caldera in North Sumatra comprises four overlapping volcanic craters that adjoin the Sumatran volcanic front. At 100 by 30 kilometers, and 62 by 19 miles, it is the world's largest quaternary caldera and the fourth and youngest caldera. It intersects the three older calderas. An estimated 2,800 kilometers and 670 cubic meters of dense rock equivalent pyroclastic material known as the youngest Toba Tuff was released during one of the largest explosive volcanic eruptions in recent geological history. Following this eruption, a resurgent dome formed within the new caldera, joining two half-domes separated by a longitudinal graben. At least four cones, four stratovolcanoes, and three craters are visible in the lake. The Tanduk Banua cone on the northwestern edge of the caldera has only sparse vegetation, 
suggesting a young age of several hundred years. Also, the Pusubukit, hill center volcano, 1971 meters, about 6,467 feet above sea level, on the south edge of the caldera is active. The Toba eruption of the Toba event occurred at what is now Lake Toba about 73,700 years ago. It was the last in a series of at least four caldera-forming eruptions at this location, with the earlier known caldera having formed around 1.2 million years ago. This last eruption had an estimated VEI of 8, making it the largest known explosive volcanic eruption in the Quaternary. Bill Rose and Craig Chesner of Michigan Technological University have estimated that the total amount of material released in the eruption was at least 2,800 kilometers, 670 cubic miles, about 2,000 kilometers, 480 cubic miles of ignimbrite that flowed over the ground, and approximately 800 kilometers, 190 cubic miles that fell as ash mostly to the west. However, as more outcrops became available, Toba possibly erupted 3,200 kilometers, 770 cubic miles of ignimbrite and coignimbrite. The pyroclastic flows of the eruption destroyed an area of at least 20,000 kilometers square, 7,700 square miles, with ash deposits as thick as 600 meters, 2,000 feet, by the main vent. The eruption was large enough to have deposited an ash layer approximately 15 centimeters thick over all of South Asia. At one site in central India, the Toba ash layer today is up to 6 meters, 20 feet thick, and parts of Malaysia were covered with 9 meters, 30 feet of ash fall. The subsequent collapse formed a caldera that filled with water, creating Lake Toba. The island in the center of the lake is formed by a resurgent dome. The exact year of the eruption is unknown, but the pattern of ash deposits suggests that it occurred during the northern summer, because only the summer monsoon could have deposited Toba ashfall in the South China Sea. The eruption lasted perhaps two weeks, and the ensuing volcanic winter resulted in a decrease in average global temperatures by 3.0 to 3.5 degrees Celsius to 6 degrees Fahrenheit for several years. Ice cores from Greenland record a pulse of starkly reduced levels of organic carbon sequestration. Very few plants or animals in Southeast Asia would have survived, and it is possible that the eruption caused a planet-wide die-off. However, global cooling has been discussed by Rampino and Self. They conclude that the cooling had already started before Toba's eruption. This conclusion was supported by Lane and Zelinsky, who studied the lake core from Africa and GISP2. They concluded that there was no volcanic winter after the Toba eruption, and that high H2SO4 deposits do not cause long-term effects. Furthermore, due to the low solubility of sulfur in the magma, the emission of volatiles and climate impacts are likely limited. Since the major eruption less than 70,000 years ago, eruptions of smaller magnitude have also occurred at Toba. The small cone of Pusuk Bukit formed on the southwestern margin of the caldera and lava domes. The most recent eruption may have been at Tanduk Benua, on the northwestern caldera edge, suggested by a lack of vegetation that could be due to an eruption within the last few hundred years. Some parts of the caldera have shown uplift due to partial refilling of the magma chamber, for example, pushing Samosir Island and the Uluan Peninsula above the surface of the lake. The lake sediments on Samosir Island show that it has risen by at least 450 meters, 1,476 feet since the cataclysmic eruption. Such uplifts are common in very large calderas, apparently due to the upward pressure of below-ground magma. Toba is probably the largest resurgent caldera on Earth. Large earthquakes have recently occurred in the vicinity of the volcano, notably in 1987, along the southern shore of the lake at a depth of 11 kilometers, 6.8 miles. Such earthquakes have also been recorded in 1892, 1916, and 1920-1922. In 2016, a study revealed that the Toba supervolcano has a magma chamber containing 50,000 cubic kilometers, 12,000 cubic miles of eruptive magma, about 30 to 50 kilometers, and 19 to 31 miles underground. This makes the supervolcano's magma chamber more than four times larger than the volume of Lake Superior in North America, 
and also larger than the magma chamber underneath Yellowstone, we can only remain hopeful that this volcano continues to remain docile, despite the recent uplifts it has started experiencing, and hope that the next supervolcano is not as active as Yellowstone and Toba. La Garita Caldera Garita Caldera is a large supervolcanic caldera in the San Juan volcanic field in the San Juan Mountains, near the town of Creed in southwestern Colorado, United States. The eruption that created the La Garita Caldera is among the largest known volcanic eruptions in Earth's history. The La Garita Caldera is one of several calderas that formed during a massive ignimbrite flare-up in Colorado, Utah, and Nevada from 40 18 million years ago and was the site of massive eruptions about 28.01 plus 0 0104 million years ago during the Oligocene epoch. The scale of La Garita volcanism was the second greatest of the Cenozoic era. The resulting ash flows the volcano created, most notably, the Fish Canyon Tuff, has a volume of approximately 1,200 cubic miles, 5,000 kilometers, giving it a volcanic explosivity index rating of 8. By comparison, the eruption of Mount St. Helens on 18th of May 1980 was 0.25 cubic miles, 1.0 kilometers in volume. This supervolcano has not shown activity in recent times, and we hope it remains that way. Compared to Yellowstone and Toba, the next supervolcano on the list does not quite measure. Cerro Guacha. Cerro Guacha is a Miocene caldera in southwestern Bolivia's Sur Lipez province. Part of the volcanic system of the Andes, it is considered to be part of the Central Volcanic Zone, CVZ, one of the three volcanic arcs of the Andes and its associated Altiplano Puna Volcanic Complex, APVC. Cerro Guacha and the other volcanoes of that region are formed from the subduction of the Nazca Plate beneath the South America Plate. Above the subduction zone, the crust is chemically modified and generates large volumes of melts that form the local caldera systems of the APVC. This supervolcano has not had activity in quite some time, and we hope to keep it that way, and other supervolcanoes we hope can remain this way. Next on the list is a supervolcano, one of the magnitude of the Yellowstone and the Toba. Galan Volcanic activity at Galan is the indirect consequence of the subduction of the Nazca Plate beneath the South America Plate and involves the infiltration of melts into the crust and the formation of secondary magmas, which after storage in the crust give rise to the dacitic to rhodacitic rocks erupted by the volcano. Galan was active between 5.6 and 4.51 million years ago when it generated several ignimbrites known as the Toconquist group, which crop out mainly west of the caldera. The largest eruption of Galan was 2.08 plus 0.02 million years ago and was the source of the Galan ignimbrite which covered the surroundings of the caldera with volcanic material. The volume of this ignimbrite has been estimated to be about 650 cubic kilometers, 160 cubic miles. After this eruption, much smaller ignimbrite eruptions took place, and presently, two hot springs are active in the caldera. The basement beneath the caldera consists of 6365 million years old metamorphic and sedimentary rocks of the Precambrian to Paleozoic age. These include intrusions of granitoid character and are overlain with Paleozoic marine sediments. Ordovician units are also present and form sediment layers up to 7 kilometers, 4.3 miles thick. Basement outcrops occur in the northeastern margin of the caldera. About 14.5 million years ago, volcanic activity started in the region, first west of Galan, but by 7 million years ago, it shifted to the future caldera, forming the Cerro Colorado, Pabellon, and Cerro Toconquis composite volcanoes on its future western rim. The more westerly centers are today represented by eroded volcanoes. Since about 6.6 .6 million years ago, volcanic activity produced rocks of both mafic and silicic compositions. The increase of volcanic activity has been attributed to the steepening of the Nazca Plate slab, which allowed mantle material to penetrate the space between the lower crust and the slab. 
north of 21 degree, degrees southern latitude ignimbritic volcanism started earlier, generating the Altos de Pica and Oxaya formations. Mafic volcanism occurred south and west of Galan, both before its large eruption and afterward in the valley of Antofagasta de la Sierra, and may have continued until less than 10,000 years ago. The positions of the exact vents are controlled by recent fault systems in the region. Since about 10 million years ago, the area has been subject to reverse faulting which has disrupted the basement along north-south lines, forming a rift valley that also stretches from north to south. The magma erupted by the Galan system was likewise channeled along such fault systems, and neighboring volcanoes were similarly influenced by them. The fault systems at Galan proper are known as the Diablillos. Galan Faults Another major lineament in the area is the Archibarca lineament, which is formed by a strike-slip fault that extends from the northwest to the southeast in the region and intersects the Diablillos Galan faults at the location of the caldera. The formation of the Galan magma has been explained by the melting of lower crustal rocks under the influence of rising basaltic magmas that supplied the heat needed for the melting processes and which also directly contributed to magma formation through mixing events. Further metasomatism in the crust and fractional crystallization processes completed the magma genesis process. Probably under the influence of larger scale tectonics, magma that accumulated into a mid-crustal mush zone is eventually transferred into shallow magma chambers at depths of 8 to 4 kilometers 5.0, 2.5 miles. Recharge events where deep magma entered, the shallow magma bodies may have triggered eruptions at Galan. After the eruption, a leftover pluton would have been generated inside the crust. Based on the presence of two separate populations of pumice in the Galan ignimbrite, it has been inferred that there were two types of magma in the magmatic system during the Galan eruption, a larger volume of so-called white magma and a gray magma which was injected into the white magma pool and eventually rose above the latter. More generally, it appears that before each eruption, there were two batches of magma present beneath the volcano, which, however, were very similar, owing perhaps to a homogenization process that took place deep in the crust. Before the eruption, the magma is estimated to have been 790, 820 degrees Celsius, 1,450, 1,000, 110 degrees Fahrenheit hot. The post-caldera volcanic systems appear to be rather ill-defined, however. The most recent activity was tectonic and consisted of movements along the faults and mafic volcanism in Kawasi formation farther west. Seismic tomography indicates that there is still a melt zone under Galan, the Chero Galan mush body. An earthquake swarm was recorded on the 25 January 2009, mainly under the resurgent dome, and may reflect hydrothermal or magmatic activity. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our channel and check out another of our interesting videos.